On the afternoon of June 22nd, 1893, Admiral Sir George Tryon of the British Royal Navy overlooked an annual training exercise off the coast of Tripoli, Phoenicia, which is now Lebanon. Tryon himself was aboard his flagship, the HMS Victoria, while he signalled formation and manoeuvre orders to a fleet of ten other ships. Admiral Tryon was a radical officer with an overbearing personality, and was known to use unconventional methods of attack. However, he was respected, and these methods were rarely questioned. On the same day, and 3,000 miles away, a party was held at an address in Eaton Place, Belgravia, central London. The hostess was Lady Clementina Tryon, the wife of George Tryon. When one of the guests approached Lady Clementina, congratulating her on her husband's return, the confused hostess told the woman that it was impossible, her husband was still at sea. The guest assured her that she was wrong, she had just seen George Tryon in one of the rooms of the large house suggesting then that maybe she wasn't meant to know, and that he had made a surprise appearance. Lady Clementina insisted that it must have been a case of mistaken identity, and on investigation, no one of George Tryon's description was in the room the guest had claimed to see him in, nor was there anyone matching his description anywhere else in the house. Of course, as we know, Lady Clementina was right about her husband's whereabouts. He was at the easternmost reaches of the Mediterranean Sea, Hours earlier, however, the ship he had been aboard, the HMS Victoria, had been struck and penetrated on the starboard side by another ship in the fleet, the HMS Camperdown, following an unorthodox manoeuvre ordered by Tryon himself. The HMS Camperdown was the ship of his second-in-command, Sir Admiral Albert Markham. Suffering severe damage, the HMS Victoria began to take on water at such a rate that all efforts to save her failed and it took only 15 minutes for the ship to sink. As the officer in charge, and the man who ordered the fateful manoeuvre, George Tryon's last words were heard by the survivors to be, It's entirely my doing, entirely my fault. Admiral Tryon went down that day with the HMS Victoria and 357 other men. His body was never recovered. The following story was told to author Elliot O'Donnell, and featured in his 1911 book Scottish Ghost Stories. It concerns a friend of his, a man named Mr Scarf, who swore to its authenticity. Mr Scarf explained that a few years earlier he had spent the Easter holiday with some friends in Aberdeen. One evening the conversation turned to stories of the paranormal, and the hosts relate to Scarf a story about a farmhouse nearby that was known to be haunted close to the Great Western Road. He was told by his friends that they knew the landlord well, so Scarf asked if they could arrange it for him to stay the night at the house. When approached, the landlord was reluctant to let the man stay, because he was afraid that if word got around that the property was haunted, he would forever be hounded by ghost hunters. After some persuasion, the landlord agreed that he could stay at his home alone for one night. The next evening at 8pm, Scarf, accompanied by his friend's dog, arrived at the house. Scarf immediately searched the house, the reason being, he said, was to make sure that no one else was there. This was presumably to minimise the possibility of trickery. He recalled seeing a grand old staircase looming out of the poorly lit corridor, but first he headed into the cellar, which he described as poorly kempt, cold, damp, structurally damaged, and full of insects. Mr. Scarf claimed to have the ability to sense spirits of the dead, and here, he said, below the house, was an unseen presence, watching him from the shadows. He returned to the hallway, made his way up the stairs and searched the upper floors. He then returned to the cellar. It was in the narrow hallway at the foot of the cellar steps, where he said the feeling of another presence was far more pronounced than anywhere else in the building. Within this hallway there were four doors which led to a kitchen, a larder and a storeroom. 
while the one furthest away led up to the backyard. It was in this cold passageway that he chose to settle down for the night. He fashioned a chair out of drawers from a kitchen dresser, sat down and waited. It was around 9.30pm he recalled, when the sounds of traffic from the nearby Great Western Road began to diminish greatly. Showing dedication to his night vigil, Scarf put out his one candle and waited. It wasn't until midnight, he said, that the road outside fell completely silent. All that he heard now was the occasional scurrying of an insect or creaking of the house. And even though he still felt the presence of that unseen something, nothing had occurred. The dog that accompanied Scarf that night had not followed him to the cellar, instead settling down to sleep on the ground floor. But at 2am he heard the dog snarling in the room above, followed by the panicked scratching of claws on the wooden floor. With that the dog bounded down the stairs and scrambled around Scarf's feet before jumping onto his lap. As an ice-cold chill ran through his body, be it from fear or the effects of a sudden drop in temperature, Scarf said that he heard a loud rustling from behind the storeroom door opposite. In the dim light of his torch, which he said he'd only brought for emergencies, he saw the door slowly open. Overcome by fear, the once bold ghost hunter admitted to being paralysed and close to fainting as he crouched against the wall and watched as a whitish figure shifted in the back of the room and then slowly moved towards the now open door. As the figure passed the room's threshold, Scarf could see that it was a woman, middle-aged by his reckoning, in what looked like old-style servant clothing. She had long black hair and a startlingly white face. She floated up the steps, out of the cellar and continued up the staircase to the top of the house. Scarf followed with caution, meeting her again at the top of the house, in a small open room at the side of the building. She moved to a disused fireplace at the end of the room, he said, and pointed towards the floor next to the fireplace before vanishing completely. In a state of fear and relief, Scarf fell against the window before fleeing the house with the dog, and in the light of the approaching dawn returned to his friend's house, where he slept late into the day. When he awoke he returned to the farmhouse and told the landlord about his experience, before both men went to the small room at the top of the house, where the apparition was last seen. Now Scarf claims that as a result of the inquiries carried out by himself and the landlord, it was discovered that a young servant named Anna Webb had worked at the house for a family named Piblington, who were previous owners. The family had accused Anna Webb of theft, and after the protesting of her innocence failed to convince anyone, she hanged herself in the cellar. So what was the nature of the alleged theft? Well, Anna was entrusted with the task of sending a letter which contained a considerable amount of money. When the letter failed to reach its destination, the Piblington family assumed that their young maid was the guilty party. She was taken to court over the matter, and at the inquest it said that she produced a note which read, I never stole your letter, and can only assume it was lost in the post. I am going to hang myself. As Mr Scarf and his companion now stood in the small side room, Scarf recalled that the apparition had pointed to the ground before disappearing, so the floorboards next to the old fireplace were raised. Beneath the floorboards was an addressed and stamped envelope, containing a letter and some money. Let's assume for a moment that this story is absolutely true. The mere fact that the accused committed suicide would, in many people's minds, point to guilt. It may well have been hidden with intent, but the fact that it was still sealed does suggest that Anna was innocent and that the envelope had simply been lost, having fallen through the crack between the boards. Either way, according to Mr Scarf, the letter's discovery put an end to the hauntings. I could not find any record of Anna Webb, her suicide or the inquest. This doesn't mean it didn't happen, of course, because few historical databases are 100% complete. The Red Line Square in Holborn, London was built between 1684 and 1698 on top of the old Red Lion fields, so called because they were situated behind the pub called the Red Lion Inn. Legend has it that this was the same inn in 1661 that the bodies of Oliver Cromwell, his son-in-law and parliamentarian Henry Ireton, and court judge John Bradshaw 
were housed before being taken to the Tyburn gallows to be hanged the following day. Cromwell had died in 1658 and had originally been buried in Westminster Abbey. However, following the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, the new parliament ordered the bodies of Cromwell, Bradshaw and Ireton to be exhumed, posthumously tried and then executed at Tyburn because they were considered to be the men chiefly responsible for the execution of King Charles I. After the corpses were publicly hanged and beheaded, the heads were taken to the Westminster Hall, placed on spikes and displayed on the roof. There are many ghost stories tied to the modern Red Lion Square, probably the most famous being the reported sightings of the ghosts of Cromwell, Bradshaw and Ireton, roaming the grounds in and around the square following the course of the public path as it was in the 17th century. But I'm going to cover a little known story involving artist Mrs P Fitzgerald from Worthing in Sussex, who once had an art studio at the Red Lion Square in a house owned by Dr Josiah Oldfield. Mrs Fitzgerald's active years as a fine artist are noted as being the 1930s and 40s, so it's fair to assume that this is when the alleged events took place. One evening when returning to her studio, Mrs Fitzgerald witnessed a quote poorly dressed woman leaving the house as she approached it. The old woman swept by Fitzgerald before briefly turning to the artist and saying, Lady, don't paint the bridge. When Fitzgerald turned to reply, the old lady had gone. When the artist relayed the events to her landlord, Dr Oldfield, he said that he had no knowledge of the woman at all. Fitzgerald has expressed that she believed he knew more, but was just reluctant to discuss the matter. A few days later, Mrs Fitzgerald was approached and asked to paint a roof garden which featured a bridge leading from one floor to another. Remembering what the mysterious woman had told her, she refused the commission. On the day she was requested to attend the property to paint the garden, the bridge, along with one entire level of the garden, collapsed. It's likely that, had Fitzgerald been present that day, she would have been killed. It wasn't until some years later that Dr Josiah Oldfield revealed to Mrs Fitzgerald his thoughts on the matter. He told her that he knew of a gypsy woman, suspected of witchcraft at the time of the Great Fire of London. She was attacked and killed by a mob on the premises that now housed Fitzgerald's art studio. It was October 1950 when geological surveyor Eddie McKellar awoke on the morning of his 27th birthday. The order of the day was for Eddie to pilot a solo flight from his geological survey camp in Western Australia to Fremantle on the western coast. He was to deliver a collection of geological samples for analysis and pick up new storage units on his arrival. It was a routine two-hour flight he had made scores of times before, over barren rocky landscapes that stretched for miles. He left the survey camp shortly after breakfast, soaring into blue skies in a two-engined light aircraft. About an hour into his flight, the port light suddenly cut out, apparently due to a fuel blockage, then the starboard motor began to overheat. Knowing that an emergency landing was imminent, McKellar scanned the landscape looking for a brush-heavy spot to bring the plane down. He steered towards a clump of acacia trees, but as the plane made contact with the ground, it hit a large rock, hidden amongst the trees, which sheared off a portion of the port wing. The plane then veered to the left and collided with a tree. The collision crumpled the front of the cockpit, smashed the radio, and trapped McKellar in his seat. Eddie McKellar desperately struggled, eventually freeing himself and grabbing what supplies he could before fleeing the wreck. According to McKellar, in an account written years later, the plane's fuel tank exploded before he had staggered a hundred yards. Rocky desert land stretched apparently for miles in every direction. From what he knew of the area, he estimated that he was a hundred miles from the nearest town. His leg had been cut badly, but he'd managed to bandage it before heading west where the land was more open and he was far more likely to be spotted by a passing plane. But given the scorching temperatures and the amount of land he would need to navigate, McKellar began to wonder if he would survive at all. After walking for three hours, he suspected he had been going around in circles. He felt weak from loss of blood and was suffering from shock when he found comfort in the shade of a tree. 
As he looked out into the distance, tried to collect his thoughts, and bring some clarity to his apparently useless situation, he saw a man. He was close enough for McKellar to hazard a guess that he was in his twenties or thirties, with wild reddish hair, and he wore what McKellar recognised as an Australian Air Force uniform, which was stained and ragged. The stranger began to clearly beckon McKellar to follow him north. It was not the direction that he had intended to go, but given the dire circumstances, this was his best chance of survival, so he followed. As he did, the man turned occasionally to see if the lost pilot was still behind him. McKellar continued, until a short distance ahead, he could make out a rocky ridge. Barely clinging to consciousness, McKellar watched as his strange guide disappeared over the ridge. When he climbed over it himself, he saw a group of tents, a truck and several jeeps, a short distance away in the scrubland. As McKellar dragged himself towards the camp, a group of young men saw him approach and helped him along the last leg of his journey. The camp belonged to a university botanical expedition. When McKellar tried to explain that there was another man out there, the party searched, but no one was found. They assumed that their lucky survivor was suffering from heat exhaustion, delirium and hallucinations. Following several days spent recovering in a Perth hospital, Eddie McKellar visited a local library in search of old newspaper records. What he found, he said, did not surprise him. It was a 1940 report of a pilot, missing and presumed dead, after a Royal Australian Air Force plane had crashed during a training flight east of Fremantle, which was McKellar's intended destination. When McKellar later put his story to paper, he wrote, His name was George Harding, but everyone called him Ginger, on account of his red hair. There was a picture of him, blurred and faded, taken on his wedding day, but it was clear enough for me to know, without a shadow of doubt, he was the man who saved my life. In May of 1937, a paranormal investigator named Guy Lestrange held a lecture in the town of Lowestoft, England. He was addressing members of the Lowestoft Omnibus Mutual Service Association and told them of the various experiences he had had over the years, most of which were centred around a house in the eastern county of Norfolk. From what I read, these stories, as interesting as they are, offered little more than various descriptions of unidentified bumps in the night, but during the lecture he abandoned the stories of the old house in Norfolk and described an experience he had had a few years earlier. It was early evening in December, he said, when he and a friend were driving through a quiet lane in the southeastern county of Essex. As they motored on, the strange saw, standing at the side of the road, a gaunt-looking man with an old-fashioned lantern in his hand. He slowed down to a crawl and pointed the man out to his passenger, who, in complete bewilderment, said that he could see nothing at all. The men drove on, and although completely confused as to why his companion saw nothing, Lestrange said no more. That is, until it dawned on him that his passenger had sat in complete silence for the last few miles. When asked by Lestrange why he had been quiet for so long, his passenger explained that he had been deep in thought, considering what his friend had apparently witnessed. He then went on to explain that years before, and in the exact spot that Lestrange had claimed to see the gaunt man, the dead body of a local farm worker had been found, face down in a ditch, with a stable lantern still in his hand. Apparently this was not the first time the alleged apparition had been seen. Lestrange's passenger went on to say that there had been a number of reports over the years of a thin man holding a lantern roaming the same lane. So many, in fact, that the more superstitious of the local people refused to travel that road. <laughs> 